that today for the, the work of the so that your work can further here at the church, church and all. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. most of you all. 
But, and I'm not insensitive by nature, but I'm an island to myself because nobody else gets the, crit uh, the criticism but me about this. Okay, that aside, several of you have called. You've actually sent cards. You have texted about my wife, and it means so much to us. As we put in the bulletin, she actually ended up with five incisions. She's been a tremendous amount of pain because they did both the tears and the tendons. She's, uh, uh, she's, she's recuperating very, very well. She's been basically isolated to our den. Uh, uh, Fran and, and Tim and, and Holly came over to visit the other day and got a chance to visit with her there. Uh, she's making matters worse. She's right-handed, and it's the right arm that actually was affected by all of this. So we have that as well that we're dealing with. And, of course, she's, uh, she's in a, a tremendous amount of pain, and it breaks my heart. Uh, we, she's on two major medications. Uh, one's called Tam Tam Tamadol, Tamarol, and the, other, Tamadol, and the other is called Hydrocodone. The Hydrocodone she takes six times a day and will for one week solid, and then she'll be through with that. Uh, I think within the next week, things will be a whole lot better. And uh, uh, I really, really do appreciate the calls and, and the concerns. Everything that we get uh, from you means so much to, eat, to, to, to Diane and to me especially. Uh, Brother, Brother uh, Frank mentioned that we're in Matthew chapter 7. And uh, I think that uh, we're going to look at Beginning with verse 7, where Jesus said, Seek and ye shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you. Uh, 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 I'm sorry, ask and ye shall receive, seek and ye shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you. For he that asketh receiveth, he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. I think about this as I look at it very, very specifically, and I wonder about. Jesus thought process as he was saying these types of things as we said all along we're looking at a chapter where Jesus begins his first public discourse a ministry that he's trying to get these people to transition from the law of Moses to the law of Christ and this is of course part of his law we've gone through these first two chapters especially the latter part of chapter 6 there's a lot of talk about about prayer uh, and seeking Christ and, and understanding how important it was concerning the kingdom uh, and, and all the things that we might worry about. We started here in chapter 7 where we talked about judging one another. A lot of emphasis put there in the first five verses about judging. And then he starts with the ask and you shall receive. Uh, and I thought about this a lot this week because I thought about in verse 11, and we'll see that here in just a few moments, he actually compares uh, the, uh, uh, himself, if you will, his father, more specifically, to uh, an earthly father. Because he asks, uh, or he makes a comment in verse 11, what man is there of you, what father is there of you, if his son, uh, son asks for a fish, would you give him a stone? Or if he asks for bread, would you give him a serpent? If you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly father give the, uh, those things to them that ask. Okay? So let's talk about that ask. Uh, first of all, God is our Father. Now twice back in chapter 6, we're reminded by His Son, Jesus Christ, that He knows what things we have need of even before we ask Him. So why does He tell us to ask? Why is He encouraging us to actually implore it's just like we as fathers today, okay? We want our children to recognize that we're the provider. James chapter 1, verse 17, every good and perfect gift coming down from the Father of lights. Everything that we enjoy. But it's nice to be asked, isn't it? It's nice for us to take the time to realize, and, and here's what, I, what, what came to my mind as I was making this, a, 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 first of all, humility. Okay? Sometimes one of the hardest things in the world for us to do is to ask 
for other people and their health. Be it financial, be it physical, be it whatever. We have a struggle sometimes asking. We would rather people ask us. We would rather be on the giving yet. And, and there's, of course, Acts chapter 20, verse 35 says, it's more blessed to give than to receive. And we understand that. But God tells us, to begin with, that we need to ask. And ask is much more important. When I was a child, and as I look around this room, I would say at least a third or more of you all were a child sometime when I was a child in the 50s and the 60s. We used to play a game, and I'm sure that some of you are all familiar with this game. It was called Mother May I. Shake your head if you remember. Okay. I thought there might be a few of you guys that, that well, for, for, for you whippersnappers, those that, that had never had the opportunity to play this game, it was very simple. You would elect one person to be a leader, and that person would actually stand up in the front. And it would be a group of kids. The rest of them would stand back there in the crowd. And the leader... Would, would, would bark commands. Now, they would all be on the same line, if you will, you know, side by side to begin with. That'd be the, you know, the beginning, if you will. And uh, you would call out one person. Archie's the closest to me right now. And I would say, Ar Archie, take two steps forward. And automatically, he's going to take two steps forward. But guess what? He forgot to say, Mother, may I? Okay? So, now he's punished. He's got to take two steps back. All right? or if somebody has made their way forward. And the whole purpose of that game, even that far back, is to show discipline and respect and humility, if you will. Uh, we understand, if you've been in the military, that, that there are commands. And uh, we was told, I'll, ne I'll never forget this, from the very onset of my, of my military, never anticipate a command. You know what that means? Don't jump on it before you're told what to do. Don't just assume that this is the right thing to do. Allow someone else. And, uh, James talks about in chapter 4 and verse 10 about being humble. Humble yourselves on the side of the Lord. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 6, the same type of concept is, is said there. And we even have songs about being humble. I'm not going to get political here. But I am going to say this, a horrible week for our government, for our country, totally horrible. And one thing I can say, and I've been an advocate of this man for the last four years and even before, sometimes our president needs to learn to show a little humility. Not just our president, our government in general. It's important, it's important that we can be humble and not always arrogant or condescending or disrespectful. There is something to be said for asking. The second point that he makes there, <clears throat> seek and you shall find. When I thought about that word, first thought that came to my mind is, in and of itself, that can be ambiguous. What does he mean by seek? What am I supposed to seek? All right. If you go back, and I noticed this in studying, the first 11 verses of, I'm sorry, 11 times in chapter 6, it's mentioned seeking the kingdom of God. Okay? Uh, verse 33, he even says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. But the kingdom is mentioned some 11 different times. Those of us who have studied our Bible understand Back, back in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, when Peter came to, to, uh, to Jesus, uh, when Jesus came to Peter and the other apostles, he said, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? It was Peter that said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And, and, and it was Jesus who said to Peter, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood did not reveal this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say to you that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Now, and then in verse 19, I'll give you the keys to the kingdom. In the original Greek language, the word church in verse 18 and the word kingdom in verse 19 are the same term. When the, the word kingdom is used subsequent to uh, uh, the Gospels, especially uh, Acts chapter 2 and beyond, 
you're going to find out they're talking about the kingdom of Christ, the church. Those that are in the kingdom are in the church. It's one and the same. And that's, of course, what is being emphasized so very, very much. When we talk about seeking, in Matthew chapter 13, it's a rather, rather long chapter. Jesus gives several different parables. But he gives two different parables about the, uh, the woman with the lost coin and the, the pearl uh, of great price and how in both cases people were willing to give up everything to be part of, to own that particular thing. And of course the symbolism there is it is the church. The church for us should be more important than anything else. We should seek the church. Before any of our, and we've talked a lot about this, so I won't go into a lot of detail about that, but we understand that's exactly what he's making reference to. Uh, we mentioned even just last week in Luke chapter 14, Jesus says that we have to love him more than we do our own family. So when we talk about seeking, we've got to seek Christ even before we seek these other things. And while we're talking about seeking, and I just mentioned the church, I mentioned Christ, and the third thing about the seeking is we need to seek righteousness. Righteousness, Proverbs 14, verse 34, exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. I want you to dwell on that thought for just a moment, okay, brethren? If ever in my lifetime I've ever considered my country non-righteous, it's now. There is so much sin and corruption going on today that it's scary. It causes fear in the hearts of most of us. But the, 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 the term we use today, Christians have to take the high road. We've got to continue to pursue righteousness. And, and when we think about that, uh, a good, good example. Jesus said in John chapter 8 and verse 12 uh, that I am the light of the world. Uh, uh, and, and back in Matthew 5, he says, you are the light of the world. Light illuminates. Brethren, I've uh, gotten to know a lot of people already in this community, mainly because we eat out too much. Okay, But in addition to that, it doesn't matter if it's the bank, if it's at Walmart, if it's wherever I might go, I've gotten to know people. And the thing that I, as your preacher, and more importantly as a Christian, I try to illuminate Christ wherever I go. Everybody that knows me and knows me personally here knows who I am and what I stand for. And that's the way it should be with every one of us, not just with the people that we interact with, but with everybody that we know. All of our family, all of our friends, all of our neighbors, all of our neighbors, every one of them know. They see me, probably the only one on my block, and Holly lives in my neighborhood, I'm the only one on my block that gets up and dresses up and goes out, as far as I know. Uh, that's one thing I can say about the South. The South, as a general rule, go to church more. And of course, the pandemic has probably curbed a lot of that as far as that part goes. But the fact of the matter is, that's who we have to be. We have to be the righteous people. Probably, as I said a moment ago, more than ever, that we need to strive in that, that regard. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 19. Then he says, knock. Okay? And as he talks about knocking, uh, uh, the first thing that came to my mind is Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20, where Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. You know the thing about a door? First of all, it has the ability to allow people to come in or to stop people from coming in or to go out either way. And so Jesus says that basically, I'm coming to your door and I'm knocking and you've got a choice. You can let me into your heart or you can keep me at bay, okay? And later on, he actually talks about this because I, I wrote it down, John chapter 10 and verse 9. And I don't know if you know this, but seven times in the Gospels, Jesus uses the term I am. Matthew 5, uh, uh, he says, I am, I am the, the way, the truth, and the life. John chapter 14, verse 6. He says, I'm the good shepherd. He talks about, as we mentioned right here, I'm the door, okay? 
Now, here's the interesting thing. The sheepfold, according to John chapter 10, had this wall, and it wasn't really very tall, maybe three to four feet, according to our current measurements, but it had only one opening. And here's the interesting thing. At nighttime, the sheep would be brought into that round opening, if you will, and the shepherd would recline himself across that opening to keep the sheep in and to keep the wolves or what other attackers might be coming from the outside. That was his job. That was his responsibility. And Jesus goes into great detail to explain that to each and every one of us as we understand ourselves. Well, brethren, we're Christ's sheep, and he is the only access. There's no other way under heaven given among men, Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, whereby we must be saved through the name of Jesus Christ. There's no other way that we might be able to enter in. Now, here's what I want to do. In verse 12, it's what we now refer to uh, as the golden rule. It is so important that one verse, because in verse 13, he's going to switch gears altogether. But in verse 12, I am going to isolate that verse for an individual sermon next week. It's that important because it's how we treat one another. How we act and we act one toward another. How we perceive one another. What we expect from one another. And if we expect that, how that we can we respond in, in kind, in favor, if you will. <clears throat> but back, if you will, to verse 11. What man is, what father is there of you if his, if his son asks for, for bread, would he give you give the stone? If he asked if he asked for fish, would he give him a stone? If he asked for bread, would you give him a serpent? Or it might be reversed, but saw right there in verse 11. Here's the thing. Because he concludes that verse by saying, If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give good things to them that ask him? Number one, I know most of these men now. And I know that every one of you men have worked hard all of your life to make sure that your children were provided for. I know that in many cases, there were two and three jobs involved. There were late nights. There were sacrifices through those children being brought up. Uh, many of you probably emulate, emulate your own father and your grandfather, okay? That's the way good men operate. That's the way good fathers oper operate. It's pretty much understood within this context that that's what God expects from good fathers. But then he says, rather than good, if ye then being evil, because Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 6, the most righteous of men, the most righteous of men is evil according to God. Okay? Because we're not. We're not, we're not perfect. We're, we're full of flaw. We make mistakes all the time. So he asks that question. If you understand this concept, that we as human fathers are not going to give something adverse to what our child asks for. If he asks for a fish, we're not going to give him a snake. I mean, that's kind of asinine, the very thought. But Jesus is making a point there, okay? Or if he asks for, for bread, uh, uh, would we give him a stone? Here, eat this rock. This will do you. You know, we're not going to do that. But the emphasis is on the flip side. How much more shall your heavenly Father give to those that ask Him? But the condition is asking. You see, when I was a teenager, I never forget this. We had this little brochure that we passed around. We gave it out to people just like we do many of the other, uh, 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 other brochures to get them to start thinking about the Bible. And on the outside of the brochure was a picture of a treasure chest. And the caption on this brochure said, Someone died and left you a fortune. And of course that someone was Jesus Christ. But you know what? If it's a great uncle, uh, 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 some other family member, 
You still got to go down to that bank or that law, 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 lawyer's office. You still got to sign the paperwork. You've got to take action on your part to receive that gift. That does not negate the fact that it's a free gift. It's still free, but there's some requirement that's there. Well, Christianity is free. There's nothing we can do to purchase it, nothing. Because if that were the case, we'd all die and have no hope whatsoever. But the fact of the matter is, God expects us to ask. He expects us to pursue Him. And He expects us to appreciate that which is given. Brethren, this morning, as you think about your life, your relationship with one another, your, especially your relationship with your God, if in any way you're subject to this invitation, please come while together we stand alongside.